Good evening, everyone. I'm Wendy Luger, the university librarian here, and it's gratifying to see so many of you uh, come out to reflect on a very powerful exhibit that, that I hope you've had a chance to look at as well. Uh, it's entitled, it's up in our atrium gallery, Campus Divided, Progressives, Anti-Communists, Racism, and Anti-Semitism at the University of Minnesota, 1930 to 42. Now the libraries, we, we believe, uh, have a unique intellectual space, a place where you can explore controversial issues, the university's history, and to engage scholars and, and all of you in the community in a conversation. Drawing on the university archives, institutional records housed here in Anderson Library, curator Riv Allen Prell and co-curator Sarah Atwood Hoffman, have revealed the historic documentation of activities that cast a disturbing shadow in the post-World War I period. Activities that bear examining in today's light. Now before introducing our speakers for this evening, um, I'd like to read a letter from President Eric Kaler. Uh, President Kaler had a prior commitment and is out of town, but he very much wanted to be a part of this important program. Dear friends, our University of Minnesota is founded in the belief that all people are enriched by understanding. Our university is dedicated to the advancement of learning and the search for truth, to the sharing of this knowledge through education for a diverse community, and to the application of this knowledge to benefit the people of the state, the nation, and indeed the world. Thus, it is part of our mission to examine and acknowledge our own history, a campus divided, progressives, anti-communists, and anti-Semitism at the University of Minnesota, 1930 to 42, sheds light on a critical piece of our history that some may find unfamiliar and uncomfortable. It highlights actions by some in the past that we would condemn today. As an institution of learning and respect, we must acknowledge our past and commit each and every day to our mission of education and progress for all Minnesotans. Furthermore, we owe it to the courageous figures who fought for change to not forget the inequities they overcame and the progress they made. To continue our examination of the university's past and guide our responses going forward, Provost Hansen and I today asked Twin Cities College of Liberal Arts Dean John Coleman to chair and assemble the President's and Provost's Advisory Committee on University History to guide our thinking and about appropriate modern responses to historical issues on our campuses. Our Committee on University History will include our university historian, university archivist, faculty, students, and other representatives from all of our campuses and representatives from University Services, the University of Minnesota Alumni Association, and the University of Minnesota Foundation. Dean Coleman will lead the system-wide conversation and research, and he will bring recommendations to the provost and me that we will then discuss with senior leaders and, as appropriate, the Board of Regents. Thank you to co-curators Emerita Rivell and Prell and PhD candidate Sarah Atwood for their scholarship, and to other members of the advisory team who helped make Campus Divided possible and powerful. By reflecting on our past, we can and we will continue to move forward. Sincerely, Eric Kaler, President. Our first speaker this evening is Executive Vice President and Provost Karen Hansen. And next, we will hear from Riv Ellen Prell, Professor Emerita of American Studies and immediate past director of the Center for Jewish Studies here at the university. And she will be joined by co-curator and PhD candidate uh, in American Studies, Sarah Atwood Hoffman. And finally, John Wright, professor of African American and African Studies and a former University of Minnesota student activist. It's a very full program, so let's begin. Provost Hansen. Thank you, Wendy. And, and first, I want to add my thanks to Professor Rivellen Prell and PhD candidate Sarah Atwood Hoffman for their archival work and the construction of this stunning exhibition. 
and acknowledge the staff of the libraries, too, for the help they gave to Rebellin and Sarah in preparing an exhibition of a shocking, too little known thread in the history of this institution. And I want to thank, belatedly, the student activists and their allies who believed in the promise and the animating ideals of this land-grant university and who, against the elements that failed to honor these ideals, kept pushing to make this a better place. I say the elements that failed to honor our ideals. Does that mean the particular individuals, administrators, university personnel, and members of the Minnesota community who behaved so badly? Or were the elements that failed more general, abstract, somehow more social and environmental, state and federal laws, or their absence, university rules and regulations, or their absence, or the morally deficient historical era? I meant to denote both the particular and the general, both individuals and a social system. Racism is the original sin of the United States, and it's the shame, the enduring stain of racism and anti-Semitism and other forms of bigotry and vile discrimination that set a context for the actions and events chronicled in this exhibit. But it is also individual people who failed, Kaufman and Nicholson most saliently, but also every other member of the university community, faculty and students, and administrators who knew what some of these people were doing and who were perhaps helping them in the process and who didn't think it was wrong or who did think this discrimination was wrong but still acquiesced, didn't object, didn't stand up against these policies and this behavior. There may be many who were caught in this web of failure and that's worth pondering. Laying blame, however, is not typically the most constructive act nor the bravest. So let us return to the more constructive side of gratitude for the work of those who uncovered and developed this history and this exhibition, especially Rivellin and Sarah, and the brave and principled efforts of the special heroes and heroines they have chronicled. They have all made this university a better institution. The activists whose stories are told here contributed indisputably to institutional progress. And now we have the opportunity to acknowledge them and celebrate and embrace that progress. But every step forward, such as this, leaves us in new territory, sometimes without clear navigational tools. How do we now find our way through this unsettling territory, illuminated by the revelation that we have as an institution not only failed badly during parts of our history, uh, but also that we have, as an institution, celebrated figures whose histories, whose institutional histories, are so problematic. I should, of course, acknowledge that all of us are flawed, imperfect, capable of and soiled by not only occasional bad judgment, but also moral failings. But what is crucial here is that those individual failings infected, indeed to some extent directed, the way some of these individuals did their jobs as University of Minnesota administrators, and thus shaped our institution and its history. And that, in turn, means we now have to see our implication in these histories. This is our University of Minnesota. And though it's an ever-evolving institution, its history, its institutional history, cannot be denied. Once it's made visible, it cannot, or at any rate, should not, be overlooked. What should we, what will we, make of this, our past? The US as a nation is in a heated period of reflection on its history. Since Charlottesville, the pace of removal of Confederate flags and monuments in the South has quickened animated by a recognition of their meaning, and often a more honest acknowledgement of their temporal origin and political animus. The elements of these stories of, of Kaufman and Nicholson presented here in this exhibit are, frankly, horrifying. 
are these elements honored and memorialized in, the namesake, in their namesake buildings? Just as the flying of the Confederate flag in the 1950s and to this day is inevitably, usually correctly, read as a symbol of racism, did the entablature over our student union, carved with Kaufman's name, then signify, or does it now, or will it in the future, signify an institutional embrace of racism and anti-Semitism? We are probably not yet to the point in our collective conception of the man or the memorial to have an answer. But we have to ponder these questions. We have to ask how personally oppressive the name carved in stone will be to some or all of us. We have to ask what it says about our institutional identity if we now know that the building that houses our Department of Classical and Near Eastern Studies and our honors program is named for a man who worked actively to marginalize and harm Jewish students, African Americans, and political activists. What does it say about our institutional identity that our student union, the building in which our various cultural groups meet and hold activities, is named for a man who sought actively to sustain racial segregation and diminish opportunities for racial minorities? Thinking beyond our campus, beyond the current struggles of our nation, we must acknowledge that most of the historical greats had blind spots and vices. Indeed, historical greatness can sometimes seem to require a single-mindedness or drive that can run roughshod over ordinary human decency. And again, we're all flawed, and even our best institutions, created by us and thus liable to inflection by our flaws, are also not perfect. But we should always strive to do better, both personally and institutionally. What does that mean right now, contemplating what we know from the work that's been done here, and contemplating what we know both about human frailty and the power and effects of cultural commemoration? Each of us will tend to his or her own individual soul or moral character. But what will we do together? What will we do institutionally? This is something we have to discover, construct, deliberately, together. I look forward to this effort. In 1924, President Lotus D. Kaufman appointed a commission of seven to plan the future educational mission of both the state's secondary school system and the University of Minnesota. He believed in the centrality of education to the future development of the state and its citizens. The committee produced a report that appeared to hew to the high standards of scientific investigation. After three years of labor, the committee compiled extensive demographic data in part drawn from the 1920 census about Minnesota students, parents' occupations, local versus out-of-state residents, among many other factors. Ultimately, the report advanced a commitment to create equal opportunity for all students who entered the university, regardless of class or geographic location. However, as Mark Soderstrom noted in his dissertation about science and segregation at the university and in the Big Ten in the first half of the 20th century, the committee used the 1920 census data for its report selectively and simply excluded the state's entire African American population of almost 10,000 people, a larger population than other ethnic groups included. Neither President Kaufman nor the committee envisioned the state's African American citizens as a group who would be central to the future and the growth of the state. It would be no surprise then that President Kaufman became the architect of racially segregated taxpayer funded student dormitories and cottages from 1931 until his death in 1938. African American students had access to the classroom and university events. Kaufman explained in a 1931 letter to the head of the NAACP. But social segregation between them and white students was the bedrock of university life. 
in a vision that he declared was, quote, entirely wholesome. Scientific management was anything but neutral. President Kaufman counted enrollments and student needs in telling ways. The files marked, quote, Negro and, quote, Jew in the papers of university presidents and dean of de deans of students included documents that monitored freshmen students' f physicals specifically for the enrollment of Negro and Jewish students. Out-of-state student housing needs were assessed with special attention to how many of these students were Negroes. Counting out-of-state Jewish students included a special category for New York Jews, who the administration likely feared would pack radicalism in their suitcases, along with their clothing and notebooks. This paradox that racism and anti-Semitism were deeply embedded in a vision for public education and the liberal arts is at the core of this exhibition. Students and faculty were certainly aware of those contradictions when their activism focused on racial and religious equality and the nature of a just society in the 1930s. Certainly they were on President Guy Stanton Ford's mind when in 1937 he stopped the exclusion of African American students from housing and called out its injustice as soon as he was made acting president. Edward E. Nicholson, who became the first dean of student affairs in 1917, embodied a similar paradox. Affectionately known as Dean Nick, he was praised for his concern for men's students and his effort to keep them in school during the Depression. However, Nicholson also believed that his job required him to limit student rights. As Dean of Student Affairs, he decided, for example, which student organizations were politically acceptable, what information was propaganda and could not be circulated, and who on the student staff at the Minnesota Daily exercised undue influence. Dean Nicholson wanted to do more than control students. He sought secretly to influence Minnesota politics and passed information to a Republican politician whose Ray Chase Institute built a case that the University of Minnesota was invaded by communists and its faculty and students were taking direct orders from the Soviet Union. The names of those faculty and students, along with their political activities and whether or not they were Jews, not only ended up on dossiers in Chase's files, but he and Nicholson passed them along to the FBI. It was the late historian Hy Berman, whose work on political anti-Semitism in 1938, that uncovered those lists and surveillance that was the beginning of this project for me. Nicholson experienced no contradiction between his responsibilities to students in a public liberal arts university and his conviction that America must be for Americans and the progressive politics of the former Labor Party of Minnesota in the 30s should be defeated. Projects that raise the question of memory are often asked, is it fair to look at the past through the lens of the present? Is it appropriate to bring into focus decisions taken by leaders in another time? If we believe that in the 1930s, most colleges or universities practiced racial segregation in some, some form, or that anti-Semitism was broadly accepted, it is we who have distorted that context and time period. This exhibit reveals that racism, anti-Semitism, and American first ideologies were debated avidly and made the subject of campus political activism. Lotus D. Kaufman, Walter Coffey, and Guy Stanton Ford were university presidents of the same era, in the same region, and of the same race. Two of them enforced segregation but Guy Stanton Ford rejected it. Which of these men do we count as representative of an era? All of them, or two of them, or one of them? Were the spokesman an African-American newspaper, or the American Jewish World, or the Minnesota Daily of this, of this period not part of this era? They carried the stories that were ultimately buried with time that revealed how contested this period was and how many voices were present. It is not hindsight that drives us to remember how problematic segregation was. Were we to accept the, raci the racial hierarchy of the 30s as normal, 
we would erase the dozens, then hundreds, then thousands of people who opposed it at the University of Minnesota between 1931 and 1942. We would forget the leaders of the African American and Jewish communities who had little more than moral strength to stand up to those in power in Minnesota. Historical memory requires all of us to know what happened to all groups in our society. The range and variety of voices that reveal the past are key to history. At the same time, we are also called on to understand how those relationships between the powerful and those with less power shape how we look back on the past. We risk the double injury of an erasure of what happened as much as how we recall it if we fail to do that, and that is a grave danger. Let me just say a few words of thanks. I am so grateful for the opportunity to engage memory, and I would like to thank the groups that made it possible. Kate Dietrich of the Upper Midwest Jewish Archive took on the project, and with the cooperation of all of those at Anderson Library, made it possible to create the exhibit as part of the University of Minnesota Libraries and Archives. The Center for Jewish Studies, the College of Liberal Arts, and the Graduate School provided support for three graduate students to work on this exhibit. One of them, Sarah Atwood, has become the co-curator of the exhibit. And I'm very happy to announce today that we have launched the first phase of a digital version of the exhibit. So when the panels come down in November, the exhibit will continue. You can view it at A Campus Divided at umn.edu. You can view it in the atrium after the panel, and honestly, you can even look at it on your iPhone. I'm truly grateful to the Beverly Foundation, the Pritzig Foundation, and individual donors who funded this first phase, along with the Center for Jewish Studies, the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies, CLA, and the Graduate School for this support. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Sarah Atwood. It is so wonderful to see all of you here tonight. Thank you for coming and working off the clock. For those of you who are on campus or paying for parking, it's just, it's very heartening. Um, so first and foremost, thank you to everyone who's made this happen, um, particularly university archives and library system and the community organizations who have also um, helped fund this and made the logistics um, possible. So I also want to thank our advisory board whose enthusiasm and insight has helped us to reach such a large audience with this project and they've really helped us strengthen the framework and the scope of the project. I want to thank the library staff, in particular um, Kate Dietrich and Eric Moore who are archivists here at the university and Darren Terpstra who um, designed the exhibit and all of those um, all of those people have been with us from the beginning as we've been learning how to create an exhibit from the bottom up. Um, particularly Kate of the Upper Midwest, she's right there, um, Jewish Archives has been a boon to this project. And we have amazing libraries here at the university. If you haven't used them, you should. They are just so amazing that we are so lucky to have them. Um, I'd also like to thank the undergrad and the grad researchers who did the work that Riv Allen and I didn't have time to do. So that's Rose Myron, Rachel Hertzberger, Patrick Wells, and Jay Yates. Um, and then finally, I'd like to thank Riv Allen, who trusted me um, to, bring her on, or to bring me on to this project as we dove into it early on. Um, Riv Allen has spent countless hours on this project and has tirelessly worked to see it to fruition, both the exhibit and the digital exhibit. Um, and she deserves a very long vacation <laughs> free of Google Docs and PDFs when this is all done because she's worked so hard on it. Um, public history is for the public and by the public and it took a lot of us to get here. Um, so as we all know, there's a current movement calling for revisiting monuments and sites that commemorate individuals um, and individuals in particular with histories who have been violent, which have been violent towards people of color and indigenous populations. Um, the conversations about memorialization and renaming have captured the public's attention, I would say to a, a newfound degree, um, and multiple standpoints have emerged. Um, tear a monument down, leave it up, or change its name are among just a few of the perspectives. We did anticipate that some of these discussions may reverberate after the exhibit went up, um, and prompting these conversations, though, was not necessarily our primary goal, even though it was something of interest to us. Naming is such a hot topic, so it should be no surprise that we're talking about it now. Um, so questions such as what's, what's next, what do we do now that we know this information, 
and who should be memorialized and how are some of these questions. A Star Tribune story, which some of you may have seen, um, was posted yesterday and has already solicited some of these responses. But as many of us who engage with digital media, in particular news stories or Facebook, we always know that you should never read the comments. comments. Never read the comments, right? As a public historian, perhaps I'm a glutton for punishment. But I do read the comments, OK? And we should. I don't enjoy it. But I think that as a public historian and educator and community member, these comments can be very real, albeit acerbic and vile and ignorant. But they do reflect a portion of public opinion. There's a really good chance that students who walk into my classroom, um, their family members or friends or even people that I meet at the grocery store share in some of those perspectives. And so in this context, comments actually do matter, and we should be reading them. So already some of the comments with this exhibit that I found were along the lines of, this is in the past, no one was innocent, let's get over it and move on. These commenters, ironically enough, I would argue at least, or hypothesize, cling to documents and laws made over 200 years ago. They form the cornerstone of American democracy and daily life in the United States, even the Morrill Land Grant Act, which secured the University of Minnesota and funded programs like this, um, are documents of the past and events of the past. And yet we continue to commemorate those and actually in invoke them in our daily lives. So unable to reconcile these very real contradictions of belief, calls for getting over or moving past events is a form of selective memory at best. And at worst, at worst, it's a choice to conveniently forget and strategically forget histories which are troublesome, uncomfortable, and disturbing. Similarly, arguments that this is dredging up history are moot because historians such as Hy Berman, Linda Schlaff, um, Mark Soderstrom, Clayton Tenquist, and Laura Weber have all worked on material that intersects with our exhibit. They've been working on this material for years, and so nothing is new. Finally, those who left campus, the people in the exhibit, due to discrimination or who were surveilled or faced threats of physical violence, to them and their family members, these are not new stories at all. They were not long ago, but rather unsavory examples of how some university community members sanctioned surveillance, exclusion, and at times persecution of students and staff with whom they disagreed. These Minnesotans deliberately worked to shape their own version of campus that reflected, put bluntly, anti-black, anti-Semitic, and anti-communist values. These are the facts, and there is no disputing that while a product of their time, such actions were nefarious and borderline, if not fully, illegal. The lives affected by administrative policies and practices are featured in this exhibit, but countless others have been lost to time. This is what we have to work with today. And if we are to get, and you know, this is what we have to get a full picture of the period. Again, these stories are not new, but rather some of us are encountering them for the first time. Finally, and perhaps the most common dichotomy in these comments that I saw online exists between those who wish to remove monuments and those who do not. So of course, not even 48 hours into the exhibit being posted online, such comments have emerged. In fact, the majority of comments, if you go onto Star Trib on Facebook, um, were precisely about renaming buildings here on campus and elsewhere. But I would argue that to simply make this about renaming is not enough. For one, renaming can provide a false illusion that a one and done removal of a memorial fully acknowledges injustices and the past. But simply removing names alters actual historical artifacts such as buildings, that when we can closely examine them and rigorously and responsibly discuss them, offer us complex texts that exemplify the ways in which the ascent to power, such as Dean Nicholson's power, renders those who challenge his status quo invisible. As I was holed up in the archives, remaining buildings was the last thing on my mind. In fact, I located vast lists of students and often noted conspicuously absent groups of students like American Indian students and Asian Americans. I actually became engrossed in the students and finding out more about them. With each new name came the recognition that their stories are the fundamental counterparts to the brick and mortar memorials that we inhabit today. Most of these students have passed or are now untraceable, so we can't hear directly from them. They can't be here to speak for themselves, and we can't speak for them, but we can honor the work that they did. 
They came to the university because it was a nationally respected institution, and they knew they'd be able to secure a good, er, a good education at a fair price. They had family members or friends who suggested that they come to Minnesota, and in fact, in some instances, insisted that at Minnesota, they'd be able to gain the skills and the knowledge necessary for a strong future. Some did called themselves activists, and some did not. But what I came to understand is that both groups of students mattered. Both those who were in local hotels, unionizing housekeepers, or writing to other campuses about integrated housing, as well as those who, by the virtue of the bodies that they were born into, repeatedly confronted the injustices and prejudice of their time, and were given no choice but to advocate for themselves. Activists and non-activists alike mattered because their collective work in classrooms, on campus, and in the community, it coalesced to push public consciousness, campus policy, and the state forward. Through the purposeful and pointed collaboration among students, staff, and community members, these individuals recognized that the university had vast potential as a living and reflexive institution. They firmly believed that it could be more than a bastion of racial, ethnic, religious, and economic privilege. Unlike many today who say simply get over it, or those of us who say don't read the comments, those seeking a more equitable campus in the 1930s and 40s understood that they could not simply ameliorate or ignore policies and practices that were unjust or troubling, but rather they had a responsibility, and they took that responsibility seriously to fully and thoughtfully engage those policies and practices. Through their individual politics, or though their individual politics and positionalities were diverse, they were allied and committed to the public good and tirelessly worked their, during their time here to shape a university that would reflect a world in which they hoped to inhabit. It's a privilege, and remember, or it's a privilege to remember them tonight. Thank you. Good afternoon. I too would like to begin by thanking the uh, driving forces behind this exhibit. Uh, Rebellion has labored intensively, uh, rigorously, passionately, and with Sarah's help and the help of the other students and staff in the archives and elsewhere, have again created a an exhibit uh, that uh, clearly your presence helps tell us. Uh, uh, reverberates far beyond what we initially anticipated. And from the impact already on campus, we are to have at least one course that has uh, been created to pursue the implications of the exhibit. And uh, several departments and entities are already have, have already begun to explore the implications for their own self-images. So uh, it's a process that uh, um, we certainly want to applaud, and we hope that institutionally at the University of Minnesota um, will um, take this not so much as a, as, as, as a stain on its uh, escutcheon, but uh, as essentially as a, a stimulus to self-reflection examination. I, I want us to start with a, with a quote, a simple quote. Um, it's from a, a scholar, a historian, who was raised in a single parent family in Bedford Stuyvesant community in New York, who struggled his way through um, community college, but eventually on to university status, and earned, who earned a PhD in history. And who ultimately, while probing archives in Columbia and elsewhere about 15 years ago, uh, curious about uh, the behavior of colleges and universities towards people of color, particularly of slaves in the past, began uh, turning up documents that eventually culminated, it's three years ago, in a book called Ebony and Ivy, uh, subtitled Race, Slavery, and the Troubled History of American Universities. Um, that book uh, has played a significant role in the process of self-examination 
that uh, so many private and now public universities in this country have been forced to undergo. Some reluctantly, um, some with, uh, with fervor. Um, Greg Stevens Wilder was also powerfully influenced by the example of Brown University and by President Ruth Simmons, who was the first African American president of an Ivy League university, who in facing the, the uh, anecdotal history of Brown's implication in slavery, um, forthrightly commissioned a massive archival enterprise to indeed establish all the facts about that history. And it kind of set a model for institutions elsewhere. And over the course of the last uh, decade and a half now, a long stream of major institutions have begun probing the past, uncovering hidden and suppressed histories, and spurring us to reimagine who we are by uh, confronting who, in fact, we have been. Uh, Professor Stevens, as he has toured the country since the publication of his book, uh, needless to say, has, confront has confronted similar issues campus after campus. And his own comments, there was a superb article in March in the Chronicle of, of Higher Education um, about uh, his scholarly work and, again, the dialogues that he's been involved in at the colleges and universities around, around the country. Um, he has uh, repeatedly uh, said, once again, I'm going to quote now, about this, particularly as it concerns been the matter of, of, of monuments, memorials, and so forth. Campuses are not museums for the emotional and psychological bigotries of their administrators and alumni. Campuses are not museums for the emotional and psychological bigotries of their administrators and alumni. Mm -hmm. Good deal is capsulized in that phrase. And uh, he has uh, deployed it in a variety of contexts. All right. At Yale University, for instance, um, where John C. Calhoun's, the college name after John C. Calhoun, has become one of the uh, pivot points in its debates about its history of involvement with slavery. Um, well, anyway, uh, there's a long series of institutions where basically he has again and again confronted these matters. About his own work, uh, which initially uh, faced a good deal of dismissal or quibbling about some of the minor details of his, uh, his work. Um, he says, first of all, that uh, critiques that have focused on a polemical motive behind what he's doing uh, very much missed the point. And that if indeed it was revenge or some kind of political advantage he was seeking, that uh, the hard reality is that historical Scholarship is a very poor tool for revenge. <laughs> uh, what he has insisted on, uh, wherever he has gone, and I'm certain that uh, in the context of this public university, this public land-grant university, uh, again, he would say as well, that the, uh, the implications here of our own probing our uh, painful past um, are such that uh, w without facing um, what has been hidden, evaded, diminished, and so forth, we will continue to replicate the issues generation after generation of students who confront, as they inevitably will, the, uh, the breaks in the veneer of, uh, of civility that, again, the story here, this exhibit uh, tells, has now been revealed uh, publicly. My own approach to this enterprise, uh, on the one hand, is a, you know, is, is a scholarly approach. I've tried to be scholarly and talking with Rev. Ellen and Sarah and others and so forth, but it's also very personal at another level. Um, I'm a fourth generation Minnesotan, and my uh, father and my aunt were students on this campus uh, in the 1930s and were engaged in battling 
with Lotus Kaufman and the administrators and professors and so forth on this campus on a variety of fronts. And I grew up hearing anecdotally, again, within my family and from their friends who were here, stories about Lotus Kaufman all right, and Nicholson and an array of professors whose names I can't mentioned. The exhibit hasn't been able to go into detail about what took place in classrooms. It's alluded to some of the kinds of insults and humiliations that athletes suffered and so forth. And of course the bars put up in, at, at fraternities and sororities and so on. Um, but this was a time, again, uh, when uh, a global perspective um, was being forced on students particularly students of color who uh, also were, had their eye on what was happening in Germany. Some of the events, again, of this, uh, this exhibit points to are clearly paralleled, obviously, by the rise of the Third Reich. And one of the ex exhibit points here has to do, in fact, with one of the ministers of, uh, of the, uh, the government of Adolf Hitler, who was invited to this campus at the same time that uh, um, figures of a opposing perspective uh, were denied public access and a voice. Uh, my, one of the stories that uh, I was told again early on had to do with my aunt when there was a, a picture or a couple of pictures of her in the enterprise. Her name was Martha Wright and she was an extraordinary young woman. She'd been the class valedictorian of North High, uh, class of 1934 time when North High, unlike today, which is considered to be largely a, quote, black school, and there were only in 1934 about this many black students at North High, and she was the class of valedictorian. And started at this university in the fall of 1934 at the age of 16. And she was in uh, what was then called the School of Technology. And she was one of, as far as I can tell, only perhaps two, possibly three women in the school. But she came from a, a, a family background that had been engaged deeply with the struggle for social justice. And her mother, my grandmother, had been an organizer for a Philip Randolph's Brotherhood of the Sleeping Car Porters. Earlier um, had uh, allied herself with Frederick McGee, again the, the local African-American lawyer who W.E.B. Du Bois said was the real origin of the Niagara Movement and of the NAACP. Um, she had uh, created a, a club called the, uh, <laughs> the, the Pioneer Colored Women's Economic Development Club, all right, that was lauded, again, in, in the, the Messenger magazine in 1927 by A. Philip Randolph and Chandler Owen, uh, lauded for its uh, forthrightness and its, uh, its dedication, again, to economic aut autonomy for um, black women. At any rate, she came from a, a, a family context uh, where struggle or education, where uh, personal integrity were all cardinal virtues. And uh, she would ultimately come again in 1937, the president of the Council of Negro Students, which the uh, exhibit points to, uh, was again the, the first, as far as we know, the first political organization of African-American students on this campus. And they battled uh, President Kaufman and Nicholson and Middlebrook and Willie and the others, again, over these issues, again, of exclusion from the dormitories and the social life elsewhere on campus, did so intensively. And uh, unfortunately, I uh, was much too modest uh, from my vantage point about those efforts. She and some of her other friends who became parts of the uh, Omega, I'm sorry, the, uh, the Omega Sci-Fi uh, Fraternity for Black Men and the Alpha Kappa Kappa Sorority for Black Women, which we have a picture of two of those in, in exhibit here, um, were part of, again, a tight network of social clubs and organizations in an African-American community that in the 1920s and 30s in this country, in this, in this uh, uh, country was one of the most highly educated and uh, aspirational. And uh, unfortunately, many of their peers, and this part of the, this part of the story that can't be told in these over here, 
did not come to the University of Minnesota precisely because of the policies and the practices and the philosophies, again, of the president and the deans and so forth, and routinely went instead, again, to the historically black colleges and universities, ironically, in that words, all right, migrating south all right, into, into southern deep Jim Crow for personal autonomy and achievement and profession. All right. Um, Dick Gregory, the comic activist and vernacular philosopher who passed away last month, back in 1970, when he was asked to talk about the differences between um, black life in the South and black life in the North, um, had this, this very, very quotable thing to say, that in uh, the South, uh, they don't care how close I get, as long as I don't get too big. In the North, they don't care how big I get, as long as I don't get too close. Okay? The same year, 1970, uh, a book that still has powerful uh, 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 value, I think, for us, uh, called White Racism, a Psychohistory, by Joel Koval, was published. And it uh, worked what uh, uh, Dick Gregory's uh, vernacular framing provided into a, a, a loftier uh, uh, psychoanalytic framework. And the southern framework was what Koval referred to as dominative racism, the kind that had been made possible again by the traditional history of slavery and its violently oppressive institutions and which enabled, again, warm relationships or intensely hot relationships between slave masters and, and slaves, so forth, and also close physical proximity. There was no need for, for, for physical separation of the sort in the plantation south. Aversive racism was uh, what uh, the name that he gave for northern style, Jim Crow, all right, in which distance and uh, again, uh, uh, aversion and bu building walls and barriers uh, became characteristic then of this northern style enterprise. Part of what's at work in this exhibit is, is basically the working of, these, uh, of this uh, northern aversive form of racism, again, of uh, the fear of black folks getting uh, too close uh, rather than too big, as it were. We don't know much at this point. I was doing a little exploring myself about, uh, about President Kaufman, for instance, and uh, Edward Nicholson about their backgrounds. Neither of them were Southerners, all right? Both Midwesterners. Mm -hmm. Nicholson was uh, an Ohioan, trained in Kansas and Nebraska and so on and so forth. And Lotus Kaufman uh, was born in Salem, Indiana, small rural community. Um, but one of those communities that in Indiana, uh, in the years of his adolescence and early adulthood, uh, was uh, in the process of becoming the national capital of the revived Ku Klux Klan, mm -hmm. and which in the early 20s right, elected as its governor, card-carrying member of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, Coffin's biographers have not explored these kinds of issues, in part because the history and biographies we have of him um, have not pointed at all in this direction. Whether, in fact, we can connect President Kaufman as the, the reason for the kind of statements we have in print for him to that kind of environmental influence remains a matter, a matter for some other graduate students, researchers uh, <laughs> ahead. But it does, it again, open up some questions, some new kind of explorations again, about this phenomenon. Again, these were Midwesterners, not Deep Southerners, not born into Jim Crow. So, about the uh, monuments, the buildings, monuments, and their names. Uh, one of the important documents we have from this era, the 30s and 40s, is not provided by a formal card-carrying historian, but uh, by novelists. African-American novelist Ralph Ellison, whose 1952 novel, Invisible Man, is a kind of meditation on the history of the 1930s and the 1940s. He 
It begins literally in 1930 and ends in 1950 through the kind of looping, boomeranging of history that Ellison's narrator describes. Uh, one of the things that the, it describes is a, is a migration from the Deep South um, into the North in the early part of the novel. And when the lead character, Jack the Bear, um, leaves his southern black college and heads north, he ends up working in a place called the Liberty Paints Factory, where his main job is to assist in making a special paint for which this particular factory is best known. It's called Optic White. And it <laughs> prides itself on its purity. But ironically, the purity of the Optic White paint comes from a small portion of a blackish substance that's infiltrated in drops into the paint formula. The prime buyers of optic paint are governmental agencies who use it to paint public buildings, monuments, and statues. Um, the, <laughs> the worker in the story with whom Jack the Bear ultimately battles uh, when a labor uh, conflict breaks out, refers to optic paint in the vernacular way as whitewash. <laughs> and uh, to some extent, part of what, again, the enterprises that have been taking place in this country and over the past years have been spurred by events in Charlottesville and uh, the resurgence here of the neo-Nazis and et cetera, of course, are all part of this, this uh, phenomenon um, that we're now facing and that this exhibit, uh, again, we hope will get us to reflect on again more carefully, more tenaciously, more tenaciously again about our own uncovered past. Um, I think I have probably already exceeded my allotted <laughs> time and Rebellion chastised me in advance. <laughs> About, ram about rambling on too long, so I'll close simply by, again, by quoting one more time. All right, Craig Stephen Wilder from Ebony and Ivy. Campuses are not museums for the emotional and psychological bigotries of their administrators and alumni. Thank you. I'd like to thank all of our speakers. Um, they've given us a great deal to think about. I hope you will all join us uh, out in the atrium. We have a, a reception and also an opportunity for you to go up and view the exhibit and to talk with one another. Uh, we have a lot to think about. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.